Good morning. Welcome to St. Matthew. Won't you stand and join us in worship? Please be seated. You during Advent 2024. We three kings. No, not those three kings. I doubt that those three were kings in the first place. What do you mean? Seems to me that they were three lost travelers into something like astrology. I am the most important king in this story. I am King Herod the Great. Now, Herod. Herod the Great. Herod. I, Caesar Augustus, emperor and supreme leader of the entire Roman world, say that your name is Herod. Plain, simple Herod. I, on the other hand, am the entire reason you have a kingdom. And, as far as Christmas goes, I'm the entire reason that happened as well. It was my roads, my census, the peace that I had established. No, 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 Augustus. It was not you. And who are you? I am King David. I was the ruler of Israel 1,000 years ago. <laughs> then I'm afraid, my friend, that you are no longer relevant. <laughs> I am sorry, Augustus, but it was not you. It was God who decreed all this. You were just a pawn in his hands. How dare you? Decreed of what? That at the fullness of time, that Jesus, God's son, 
would come from heaven and be born in a manger in Bethlehem, my hometown, as foretold by the scriptures. And he would be the Messiah, the savior of the world. Well, that's our commercial break that we're having for the Advent services that start next Sunday. You'll meet some of those characters. They are characters when you come to the services as we explore those kings and who they are. Well, yesterday was a cool day because there were so many people here on campus helping out. As far as packing baskets of food, boxes of food for families to take, over 200 sandwiches made to take down to helping up mission, and then all these uh, snack bags that they use for the homeless down in Baltimore City. There was also lots of people out here helping to put up Christmas lights, and there were people that were on the roof for six hours yesterday working on Christmas lights up there. And so I thank you, all of you who have helped with that endeavor. We do need today at 2 o'clock at least six people who are willing to help put up some of the Christmas lights so that we can have them ready to go by Friday. If you can come at 2 o'clock, that would be great. Either talk to me or Joe. Stand up so they know who you are. Or talk to Joe and we can meet with you and we'll be right out here at 2 o'clock today. So if you can give us a couple of hours at 2 o'clock, that would be wonderful to help us get all this ready because it starts this Friday, this weekend, and we have the sign-up boards out in the lobby. If you can sign up to come help to greet people who will be coming in and give them cookies and hot chocolate or greet them out in the parking lot or help out in the train room. So we had a train club once upon a time and it has lost members over the years. There were some older guys, Jeff, they were old guys, not like you. And they were part of the train club, but a few of them have gone on and a few can no longer help out. And so we're down to a limited number. And if you have a passion for trains, if you would like just to be there in the train room, we would love for you to sign up and to learn how to run them because we are down just to a few people. And we do it three times each weekend between now and Christmas. So that would be wonderful. Also, on your Connect card, you'll see all these things. There's going to be Christmas caroling coming up in a couple weeks. There is Advent Bible studies that are starting. There are going to be the Christmas baskets packing. There are Wish Star gifts and a sign-up board out there to start buying presents for Wish Stars. Also, if Men of Wisdom Breakfast is in a couple weeks, you can sign up for that. And the mission trip as well. So please take opportunity on that Connect card for all those things that are coming and before all that, on Wednesday, we have a Thanksgiving Eve service at 7 p.m. So come out and let us praise the Lord together and give thanks for that as well. Well, let's stand and begin our liturgy. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. Let, him, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. Let us now confess our sins and the times that we have strayed from our heavenly Father. Let us take a moment of silence to examine our hearts and our minds. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we have strayed from you like lost sheep. In our wanderings, we have sinned against you, following our own desires rather than your perfect will. We have placed our focus on the things of this world rather than on Christ, his word, and his salvation. Forgive us, Lord, and have mercy on us. Mold our hearts 
and sharpen our senses to hear your voice and draw us into your kingdom of love and mercy. God is light. God is truth. God is love. In his mercy, God has given his son to die and rise for you. By his cross, Jesus makes peace and delivers you from all of your sins to live as his new creation. Your sins have been paid for by Christ. They are forgiven. Let us share Christ's peace with one another.
Please be seated, and the children could come forward for the children's message. You were surprised. You have a surprise? What? You didn't have any Sunday school, but you get to come to a children's message. Isn't that better? We still have a lot more kids coming up. Whoa. There's going to be a lot of kids here, aren't there? I'm surprised too. But you get to be here with us. You get to worship together. And I have a surprise for you when we finish the children's message. Oh. So, what do we have this week coming? Thanksgiving. And so, what do we do at Thanksgiving? Eat turkey. What else do we do at Thanksgiving? Thank God, right. We call it Thanksgiving, right? We thank God. What do we thank God for? What do you think? The world. The world? Food. For the fact that he lived and died for us. What else do we thank God for? Maybe all the things that we have, right? All the blessings he's given us, the family he's given us. Oh, wow. So there's so much to give thanks for God. And then after Thanksgiving, next Sunday, something special starts. Christmas. Not next Sunday. The Christmas lights. Well, the Christmas lights will start on Friday, but you're right, they're starting. Advent starts. And Advent is a time to get ready for something really big. Christmas. But, you know, sometimes Christmas is a long ways away, right? You know how from today, Christmas is 32 days away. That's a long time to wait, isn't it? And so Advent is about waiting. About waiting for the fact that Christ is going to come. And so at Christmas, we celebrate the fact that he came, and he came as a baby. But we're also, we wait and we wait because we're waiting for Jesus to come back again. And sometimes waiting can be really long. It's like sometimes you have to wait and wait for things, right? And so we've got to wait 32 days until Christmas. And so I've got something I'm going to give you when we're done to help you wait. It's an Advent calendar. And so each day you can count down as you wait. And as you wait and wait. Now we don't have a advent calendar for when Jesus is coming back but we get to remember that he is coming back and we know he's coming back but boy that would be a huge calendar maybe or maybe a small calendar we don't know but this calendar is going to help you count down to Christmas and you know inside of each of these windows is guess what a piece of chocolate so you have to wait patiently and just eat one a day until Christmas comes, okay? But we're really waiting. We're waiting for when Jesus is going to come back again, and that's going to happen, okay? So we want to remember that Jesus came when we wait during Advent, and we want to know he's coming again. So let's say a prayer, and then we'll give out the Advent calendars, okay? Let's say a prayer. Dear God... Thank you for sending Jesus down to earth, for him dying for our sins and rising so we have eternal life. Lord, we wait patiently for you to come again. But during this time that we're here, we rejoice that you did come. Help us to be patient, even as we wait for Thanksgiving and then wait for Christmas. We ask that you would have us tell others about Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay. How about if you come here and help me give these out? All right. Well, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. 
Come up here. Come help me. Can you give some of those out? One to each person. There you go. Patience, patience. Patience, patience. There you go. Whoops, Julie, we need some more up here. Another one up here. You took them all, you're not letting me help. <laughs> here. You need one too. Yep, here you go. All right. Well, with that excitement, let's pray. Let's pray with excitement. Eternal God, merciful Father, you care for all people and have made us heirs of your salvation. Fix our eyes on Jesus and move us to reflect your love and mercy in all that we say and do. May your light shine through us each day until the return of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Promise reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 50, 51st chapter. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way. And my arm will bring justice to the nations. All distant lands will look to me and wait in hope for my powerful arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, gaze down on the earth below. The heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever, my righteousness will never fail. The new promise reading is from the first book of Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you, to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. This is the word of the Lord.
Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Gee, I don't know what was more exciting, that 
trailer for Advent or those Advent calendars that you passed out, Pastor Blaze. There's a lot of excitement here this morning. I make my beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do eagerly await the return of your Son and all of his glory and power to finally make the world whole and perfect. Where all tears will be wiped away, but until then, strengthen our faith, Lord, and guide our lives in your service. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So Mark 13 begins with Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple, the disciples being in all of it. But Jesus telling them that that temple and Jerusalem will one day in the future be destroyed by the Roman Empire. And that temple, as we heard from Pastor Paul last week, was a magnificent structure made up of these enormous stones estimated to weigh between two and five tons each. But Jesus says something astonishing to his disciples. He tells them not one of those stones will be left on another. Every one will be torn down. Now, some of his disciples ask him in private, Lord, when will these things happen, this destruction that you're talking about? And it's because of that question that Jesus now begins to teach. He began last week, as we heard, and now his teaching continues again this morning as we look at the second half of Mark 13. And what Jesus makes clear in his teaching here in Mark 13 is that that destruction of Jerusalem, that destruction of the temple is a foreshadowing of the end of the world. It is a foreshadowing of Jesus' second coming of Judgment Day. And then Jesus ends all of chapter 13 by telling us to watch for it, yearn for it, long for it, my second coming. Now people struggle with this teaching, both inside the church and outside the church. People find this teaching about the second coming to be a little too fanatical too out there, if so to speak, over the top, the sun growing dark, the moon no longer shining, the stars falling out of the sky, the powers in space being shaken, the Son of Man appearing in the clouds with glory and power. Now, it's interesting that people don't have a problem with the biblical description of the first coming of Jesus. In fact, we love that biblical account. It's soft and it's gentle. There's a star in the sky. There's a baby in the manger. But when you look at the second coming, that's a lot more troublesome for us. For instead of having a radiant star up in the sky, the stars are falling out of the sky. And instead of having a baby, we see the Son of Man coming in all of his glory and power in the clouds. And so to some, this just seems too fanatical, too apocalyptic, too something. And so one of the arguments they use to debunk the second coming is to say, look at verse 30. Jesus says, truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. You see, so Jesus must have thought the end of the world was going to come during the disciples' lifetime. And guess what? It never did. Okay? So it's not true. But if you go back to verse 4, we see that the disciples asked Jesus, when will these things happen? In other words, Jesus, when will the temple be destroyed?
And so it's to that question then that Jesus tells them, I, I'll tell you when they happen, he says in verse 30, meaning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. He says, these things will happen within your lifetime. And 37 years later, the Roman general Titus sacks Jerusalem and destroys the temple. Now, other people who try to debunk Jesus' second coming as being too fanatical or whatever will say, well, the second coming is to be, to be understood symbolically. It's not to be taken literally. They say Jesus isn't coming back in a real sense. You see, he's coming back in spirit. His teaching you see, are coming back. But Jesus negates that line of thinking by declaring in verse 26 that at that time, people will see the Son of Man in the clouds. They will see him. The second coming is not symbolic, friends. It is literal. It is historic, it is visible, it is physical, and it is personal. You see, the doctrine of the second coming is a crucial part of our Christian teaching. It's not only, it's not only in the Apostles' Creed, he will come to judge the living and the dead. It's not only part of our communion liturgy where we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again, but it's also mentioned over 300 times in the New Testament. That's one out of 30 verses. And Jesus mentions it over and over again. You see, it's not some abstract doctrine, but it's intended to guide and shape the Christian's life. Will it make a difference in how we live? It should, but one of the concerns is that in America today, Christianity finds many believers enjoying life in relative comfort. Modern medicine, religious freedom, all the conveniences that are available to us not only mean comfort, but at the same time, they can diminish our yearning for Jesus' return. But on the other hand, for those who have suffered much in this world, they will not yawn at the prospect of the second coming. We need to be like the first, Christ, the first century Christians and look at the second coming as something that transcends and it eclipses all of our other yearnings and expectations. I think to really get an understanding of the second coming, we need to go all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I want it to have a sign. Welcome to paradise, I wanted to, to hold up. Why was the Garden of Eden paradise? Well, it wasn't because the temperature was set at 74 degrees all day. It was because the presence of God was there. His immediate, on the spot, absolute presence was there, along with God's overwhelming glory, his beauty, and his holiness. And where God's absolute presence is, you will not find death. You will not find disease. You will not find brokenness. You will not find things that are corrupt or vile. But when Adam and Eve rebelled, Scripture tells us that the presence of God was withdrawn. Jesus is coming back, and the entire world will see him. And then we're told in Revelation 22 that God will once again dwell with his people, restoring his absolute and powerful presence as the world is remade again into the Garden of Eden. The whole world perfected, the whole world beautified, the end of death, the end of disease, the end of hunger, the end of poverty, the end of violence, that's what we have to look forward to as God's people. 
people say, why is that fig tree illustration there? Because it ties into what Jesus is saying. He says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Now, there weren't many plants at that time in Israel that lost their leaves in winter. Most kept their leaves. However, the fig tree would lose its leaves in winter, and they would not come back until late spring or summer. And so what Jesus is implying here is, this is how it'll be when I come back. Because when I come back, I will bring the ultimate summer. When I appear again, the world will once again bloom beautifully. And it will be made perfect again. And now we come to the end of Mark 13, where Jesus warns us, be awake. Verse 37, to watch. He does not want us to be a slumbering church. I can tell you two things about how we are to watch for the second coming. One thing I know is that Jesus is coming back. And the second thing I know is I don't know when. Jesus says no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of God, but only the Father. You see, no one knows. This is a real blow to the prophecy buff industry. But how clear does he have to be? The earthly Jesus says, I don't know. Now, how do we watch? Will we watch by loving the same things that God loves? By wanting the same things that God wants and working alongside with God for these very things, doing it right now, like fighting injustice and poverty, by feeding the hungry, by helping the sick and the poor. And we do these things with the endless hope that in the end, the second coming will triumph and these things will be vanquished once and for all. Jesus is coming back and when he does, everything will be made right. And the world wants that day to come because face it, life isn't fair here. There's too much suffering here. We want justice to be served. We all, in a sense, want things that are wrong to be righted. But we have a problem because the second coming means judgment day. Jesus is coming back to judge the living and the dead. And as was, and as was pointed out by Pastor Paul last week, if there's a judgment day, that means you and me as well. We don't get an exemption we're reminded of that haunting verse in Psalm 130, which reads, O oh Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But consider this. In Mark 13, our text this morning, we're told that on judgment day, the sun will one day be darkened and the world will be shaken. And then, in Mark 15, we're told that at the sixth hour when Jesus was on the cross, utter darkness covered the entire land. And then we're told that afterwards, the earth shook and the rocks split. And when Jesus gave up his spirit, he cried out from the cross, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know about you, but doesn't this sound to you like a judgment day? And it was. It was judgment day that came down upon the Lord Jesus. No light but darkness. No healing presence from God, but instead forsakenness. You see, at the first coming of Christ... He didn't come to bring judgment. He came to take judgment. By taking our place, it was Jesus who got the rejection. It was Jesus who received death. It was Jesus who experienced darkness. Why? He paid our penalty so that we, we get the love 
we get the acceptance. We get eternal life. We get light. You see, the great judge of the universe was judged for you and me. We looked at Revelation a few weeks back and we saw that John was given a vision of heaven. And in that vision, he saw a throne, but he sees a lamb where a judge should have been. Why? Because our judge has taken our judgment for us. What a God. Friends, that is amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Amen? Please stand as we continue with the prayer of the church. Almighty and eternal God, we give you thanks for your abundant, never-ending love and mercy, your gift of grace and forgiveness, your ever-abiding presence. Grant that your church be a faithful and gentle witness of your truth and a model of your kingdom. Help us to live daily as part of your kingdom by striving to bring righteousness, kindness, forgiveness, reconciliation, and understanding into our homes and communities. Holy God, Creator God, you revealed your goodness through the majesty of what you have created, bringing favorable weather to places that affect it by storms or droughts, protect plants and animals from devastation, and guide us in our use of all natural resources. Holy God, Lord of the nations, grant that your grace guide and motivate all who are in authority. We pray for an end to the spread of hostility and violence and injustice. Inspire local, national, and world leaders to govern with wisdom, justice, and compassion. Holy God. God of mercy, shower your healing graces upon those suffering with physical and mental illness, addiction, grief, and other adversities. Guide their doctors and care teams with wisdom and compassion. Calm their hearts and minds with your peace, strength, and sustain them with your grace. Holy God. Sovereign God, grant wisdom, discernment, and patience to the call committee and our congregation. Help us to remember that this is a time of heading, heeding your word and seeking your will. Keep us steadfastness in prayer, listening to your voice, and trusting your plan for our parish. May we continue to encourage and support one another during this process and beyond. Holy God. Hear our prayers, most merciful God, and grant us grace to entrust our lives and the world to your constant and abiding care through Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. We continue with the service of the sacrament. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on us and sent your Son to bear our sin and be our Savior. Grant in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we ask you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant that our Lord's body and blood strengthen our faith so that we reflect his love for all people and give him all the glory. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and sustain us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory and honor and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, 
Drink this in remembrance of me. It is the new covenant, the new promise for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. We believe that this is Christ's true body and blood, and if you do too, you're welcome to our table. Please be seated. This empty world, a one day faith, only your truth will remain. Jesus, oh.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you steadfast in the true faith for life eternal. We pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Pastor Dave, next steps. Well, boy, do I have a deal for you, Pastor Blaze. As we watch for Jesus' second coming, I have a whole box here of binoculars that I'm, that I'm <laughs> selling off today. You want to be with? No, I'm just kidding, kidding. That's not how we watch. For Jesus. We align our hearts and our actions with his. And in verse 27, when Jesus comes back, he talks that he will gather all of his people. And so we get to work alongside now by sharing the love of Christ with others. And one way we can do that is this season, is to ask the Holy Spirit to put somebody on your heart, to invite them to a Christmas Eve service or Christmas Day or the lights or journey to Bethlehem where they can hear the gospel. And so we do the things that Jesus wants, and that's how we watch, not by those binoculars, Pastor Blaze. I get up on the church roof and I look and I don't see it. <laughs> well, here, I have a pair I can sell you right now. No, just kidding. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he look down upon you with his grace and give you his peace.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.